<laughs> well, anyway, thank everybody for coming to this program that I've, I've long awaited. Uh, Mary Foley is uh, part of the uh, Friends of Evergreen, and she's going to tell us about some of the illustrious members of Maine Charitable, some of whom are pictured on the wall here oh, yes. as presidents, that are now residing in Evergreen <laughs> Cemetery, or as uh, uh, Bob Riley says, guests at Evergreen. <laughs> guests at Evergreen. <laughs> anyway, yes. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. So again, Mary Foley, I am also a Portland history docent. I just sort of um, went through the Maine Historical Society a few years ago and chose Evergreen to do my volunteer work, and I absolutely, totally enjoy it. Um, as a friend of Evergreen, also, our mission is to restore, protect, and conserve the cemetery, which is also part of being a docent there and being there so much. And um, we've had um, a restoration there project where we, we had someone come up from Massachusetts and, you know, we survey stones and, and, and try to, um, right now there's a project going on because of, um, because it's a Victorian garden cemetery world, there was the allay of trees and a lot of the trees now are 150 years old and it's, you know, some have had to come down, but the board and with the help of us docents we're trying to make sure that we keep that LA and uh, th that's just a couple of the things we do there. Our tours are free every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. They go through, um, I, I've, I've brought the um, schedule, they go through the end of October. You can see the various tours that we have and read about them. Um, they're every Saturday morning at 10.30 and every Sunday afternoon at 2. They include Civil War, seafarers, highlights of the cemetery, and a, a tour about suffragists, many others. They're, they're all there. Also, we've just partnered with uh, Ollie, the Osher Lifelong Institute at USM, and actually that just started today. And uh, Carol, one of the docents, has worked with them. And she had 20 people sign up. So that's like an eight-week course that we'll be giving in the um, chapel there uh, of, uh, and actually I'll be part of that. I'm, we'll do the last section which I'll do my suffragist tour. And what we do is basically what I'm doing here except we're not live at the cemetery. So. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll take everyone out and uh, walk around on the tour. But it's a great learning experience because there's, there's a lot of history in Portland that you know you don't really think about. And as a Portland native, I'm always amazed at, at all the things I find out about people and what went on. So, um, I thought I'd just kind of show you, this is how I do my tour there. I have my notebook. And in this case, of the main charitable mechanics, I have the, the flags, which we'll talk about, and everybody knows about, I'm sure. But I do. I did bring just kind of a little snapshot here of, um, I'll pass it around, a handout of what Evergreen sort of used to look like, <coughs> just to get the feel of the, and when I do the tours, I always show everyone what MCNA looked like in the beginning and, and what it is now. And of course, everybody, especially if they're from Portland, they're just amazed that They've walked by that building all their life and never known it was here. And, you know, as, as a, like I say, a Portland native walking to high school every day for, from um, West End Portland, you know, Porches was over there and this was across the street. And I never, you know, walked by it a million times and even in, as an adult. And, and, and people are amazed when I tell them where it is. And I'm always saying, go there, go there. You love it. Um, so this is, um, this gives you a little perspective. I like this picture because it kind of shows you what Congress Street was like, you know, back when. So I show them that. And then I also always show them, I love the arm thing. And I tell them, go downtown Portland and look and look up and look. And they're like, oh, okay, we will. I have 24 members on my tour, 24 past members on my tour. I apologize if the some really prominent people that you you know think should be on it aren't on it, but 
when you do these tools, you have to do it also from a geographic perspective. I mean, I can't, you know, walk way down to the pond and then where, I mean, I, but I could give a tour. I mean, there's so many past members buried there that, but whatever. So, and the cemetery was founded in 1857. Um, it was designed by Charles how as a Victorian rural cemetery, which was a popular movement in the mid-19th century. Cemeteries were built with the winding roads and the paths, because, so when you're in there, you don't, you know, if you go to some cemetery, it's like a grid, you know, you see the stones all lined up, but in there, it's the rural cemetery, so it's winding and very, very, uh, very beautiful, really. Um, these cemeteries were kind of a precursor to parks that we have today. It is the second largest cemetery in Maine. It's on the National Registry of Historic Places since 1992. Over 60,000 people are buried there. Um, and it's approximately 250 acres. It's pretty big. Where's the largest um, cemetery in Maine? In Bangor. And I don't know the name, but I know that Mount Hope. in Bay is it Mount Hope? Yeah, Mount Hope. I've heard that. And um, Evergreen is the second largest. Yeah. In 1815, Portland's manufacturers and mechanics, architects, masons, furniture makers, bakers, tailors, shipbuilders, etc., formed an organization for their mutual benefit and to provide educational opportunities for their apprentices. The association still exists and is centered in its 1857 building at the corner of Casco and Congress Street. The tour will focus on 19th century business and trade leaders who work together via the association to strengthen Portland's economy. This is a signed stone by J.R. Thompson, a past uh, member of here. Um, the reason I like to highlight that is because um, you don't see many stones signed, and when you do see one signed, it's really great to document that because some of these stones are like very architecturally, they're beautiful. So it's uh, nice to, um, to know who did them. Now, um, and, and Mr. Thompson became a member in 1833, um, was a past president, uh, 45 and 46. He was located at the corner of Federal and Pearl Street. He lived on Oxford. He has signed monuments at Evergreen, which is interesting because most are not signed. And that sort of segues into Mr. Emery, who I um, really like to talk about here because we're just finding out so much more about some of the architects at the cemetery are the stone cutters or the sculptors. So Joshua Emery, his trade was stone cu cutter. He became a member in 1855, was the past president, and did most of the family plot hedging in Evergreen. Now the family plot hedging, as you can see, in the Victorian world, back that they'd buy a family plot and they'd, they'd put hedging all around it. A lot, mo I'd say probably 60, 70 percent of the lots there do have the hedging around. And we're finding that those were mostly done by Mr. Emery. Also, I found documentation that he was a, also a stone cutter, which there's um, a Willis stone and uh, William Willis' stone, Daniel Emery's stone that I have documentation that he did carve. Um, and then we have the tombs. If you've been in in Evergreen, you've probably walked down and seen the tombs, that Emery did the tombs, and then Art told me he did the, the front side of this building. It's like he just was <laughs> everywhere. It's quite the man. But this, this is a picture of him, and uh, these are just my papers so, uh, with the documentation that he, uh, he, he did those stones. Um, so this is actually his... Uh, says Emery. This is actually his, uh, his family lot, plot lot. When you say edging, you mean that concrete? Hedging. The, the hedging all around like that. Do you mean the actual concrete part? Or? Yes, yes. Okay. And then again, this is, this is his. I hadn't heard that word before, but I guess hedging because it's higher. Mm -hmm. oh, edging. Okay. Yeah, edging, edging. I could be wrong. 
<laughs> logical. So this this is Emery's um, family, and and this is one of um, one of these. I believe it. Th this is his stone, and so you can see it. Yeah, yeah. It's the yes, the the bold face lettering, which is you know another kind of hot thing to do back in the 1850s, 60s. They didn't have all the equipment there. But I'm always um, amazed at how. These stone cutters, well, Thompson, he, he wouldn't fit into that category, but their stones are so plain, you know. I just thought that there'd be some elaborate, uh, <laughs> but there wasn't, so. The next we come to will be Edward Elwell. The stone is like right up in there. It's got this, it used to be, you, I looked for that for a good couple, of, you know, where is it? Where, where the, it had grown, but finally they cut it down. His stone is there, but um, Mr. Elwell, uh, he came in as a printer, as a member in 1855. He was the editor of the Portland Transcript, which was the conservative newspaper here in Portland. I always like to say about the newspapers in Portland that you had, um, you had the, um, where is it? The Portland Transcript was the conservative. I call that Fox News. The Daily Eastern Argus was the moderate. I call that MSNBC. And then the Portland Daily Press was the liberal. I call that, no, I, CNN, sorry. CNN is the moderate. MSNBC is the liberal, yeah. Um, so, but he was the proprietor of the conservative, the, the Portland transcript. He was the founder of the Maine Press Association also. Um, he wrote the book, Portland in Vicinity. I have this, I love this book. It's just got some great, great pictures. And I, I just, I'm, I'm always look. I never get sick of looking at that. Um, he gave many, many lectures at the, uh, in here, Maine Charitable. And a quote that I like from him is, when he's referring to the Maine Charitable Mechanics is, it is an organization for charitable and educational purposes offers free evening school for instruction in industrial training. This is Mr. Charles Porter Kimball, and, and you would ask me out about him. Mr. Kimball was a carriage maker. Well, you know, you don't think, this man was so, I mean, he did so well. He, um, he was a president here from 1857 to 1868. His business was located on the corner of Congress and Preble. He left for New York in 1876, then on to Chicago and became worldwide famous for his carriages. One was called the Portland Cutter. That uh, He died in 1891 in, in uh, Chicago. But he, um, the wealth that he accumulated, uh, it, it was just, it's phenomenal. And his, he has a brother who's also buried at um, Evergreen that that I will show, but this was a picture of of his company on the corner there, and these are his companies in uh, New York and Chicago. <laughs> he, yeah, he went on to, and this is a picture of him. He and these are s some of his carriages, and in um, I think he won prizes for them at the, one of the expos in France. He was very very, and that's a picture of him and his brothers. So he he was quite the the prominent businessman. That is J.R. Thompson's stone, and you can see it's quite magnificent. Um, the cutting is beautiful, and his stone is signed, so I think he did his own stone, <laughs> or his, his son's, I mean it was a, but that's a better picture. You can see how the diamonds on there, and, the, and this is Mr. Corey here. Walter Corey, who was a chairmaker, but um, I wish I had some of his furniture because <laughs> it's, um, he was a chairmaker, came in as a chairmaker. He's a member in 1841, a uh, furniture maker on Portland um, in Exchange Street, then moved to Free Street after the fire of 1866. He apprenticed with Thomas Beals, who's also at Evergreen Home. And his um, furniture is uh, mostly displayed at the Schofield Whittier House in Brunswick, Maine. I've never s uh, been there. I've never seen it. But this is just an example of a chair and a table. And, and this is his, um, si his uh, signature, in case you're ever 
at an antique shop and you see that, buy it. <laughs> well, and there's his actual stone right there, Walter Gore. Yeah, I think it was. Now, this is an interesting stone. This is Martin Gore. Um, he's a hatter. He was a hatter here in Portland. He made hats. Um, he was a member in 1826. He came from Jamaica Plains in Massachusetts where pudding stone is only found. So this is made of pudding stone from Jamaica Plains in Massachusetts. Um, I don't know who did the stone because it's not sound. I don't like it. I don't, I'm not crazy over it to be quite honest. That's a great picture I got of it though because most of it's, if you recall, is covered by um, trees. You, you can't really see it, um, but the inter I mean, he, he was a hatter, but he dealt in the fur trade because the beaver, you know, rabbits, uh, all everything was made from, from the furs. And um, he, in 1829, the people in Ellsworth protested him and the others because they were uh, destroying all the animals for fur. It was kind of like PETA <laughs> back then. I thought that was great when I read that. I mean, people did care. Did he go mad when he died? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he, um, he was born in 1797 <laughs> and died in 1876, so he lived his about in his late 70s. That was a pretty good age for back then. So this is um, J.M. Kimball, and this is the weeping woman stone that I, I talked about. There's only four of them at Evergreen. They're, they're really, I mean, these pictures are nice, but they don't do it um, the justice. He was the brother of the other Kim, um, C.P. Kimball, uh, the eldest brother. He had a business, a carriage-making business also on Congress Street, but he retired from it in 1871 with... I've made enough money, I'm going to go live in Florida. <laughs> so he moved to Florida and <laughs> retired. But I, that, that's really pretty. It's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful representation of, of the cemetery. And then we have Neil Dow. Neil Dow and his son Fred were both members of the main charitable mechanics. They came in as tanners. His family owned uh, tanning down, oh, I want to say, like, beyond Spring Street down in that area. I can't remember the exact uh, street where they were, but uh, of course we know Neil Dow was the father of Prohibition and encouraged the uh, main charitable mechanics to abstain from alcohol abuse. <laughs> he was a Civil War veteran. He was uh, traded for Lee's nephew. He was captured. He was in Andersonville. and. Uh, back then when they would trade, and Lee's nephew had been captured by the Union, so they traded so that they <laughs> But have you ever gone to the Neil Dow House up on Congress Street? That is, is a wonderful tour. I mean, I've been there several, we just had a uh, tea there. Oh, the beginning of the summer, I can't. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was really, it, it's, it's pristine sort of like this. It, you know, his library, his original books are still there. It, it's a wonderful tour. Um, his son, Fred, as I had said, was also a, uh, a, a member of MCNA. He was also a lawyer and he served, he also served in the Civil War and he owned the Portland newspaper and he's the one who sold it to the guy Gannett. But what his son, um, Fred, Fred, did was he willed the mansion, the Dow Mansion, to the Women's Christian Temperance Union because that was the, the big Neil Dow, the big push. In, in they had the daughter, um, Cornelia, who, was, who took over that. But, so the Women's Christian Temperance Union still owns that, but they're much more deflated, you know, it's not as active of a... I mean, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was an extremely huge movement in the United States during that time. And I mean, they literally, you know, got, let, well in Maine, I mean, the, the, the drinking, the, they did acquire the abstinence of, uh, of drinking, but there was also the rum riot. <laughs> yeah. 
And if you're ever really interested in this, um, uh, Sue Devine, one of our uh, docents there, does a wonderful tour just about the rum riot and about Nathan Clifford and uh, Fezzedin and who defended him and stuff. It's, it's very interesting. So I do have some Neil Dow pictures. My next guy here, Augustus Schlotterbeck. I looked all over for a picture of him and everything, and I kept saying I couldn't find anything about a picture of him. And then the Masonic Temple opened, <laughs> and he was a big guy. He literally paid for the whole Masonic Temple. He was, this guy was a, he came in as a chemist here to MCMA. Uh, he was a member in 1868. He paid for the Masonic Temple. They were having trouble finishing it, paying for it, and he just footed the bill. But what he did, he started businesses in Portland as a prescription apothecary, moved to medi uh, medi medicines and flavoring extracts. And I think this building might look familiar to you, 15 yeah. Preble Street, it's still there. And it was uh, a John Calvin Stevens architect. but. And they still sell his products online. Now I've heard, and I didn't, I haven't thought to really check into this, that um, they were selling that building. They but sold, if they're making it into apartments, is that what's <laughs> happening? I I felt they're working yeah, on it now. Yeah. yeah, but if you drive by it, you see Charlotte Beck and Boss. But yeah, you can I still go online. The he got um, into the um, the flavoring extracts. Mm -hmm. And, and medicines of the day, you know, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, the snake oil stuff or whatever. But he, and then he also started uh, making medical equipment. He's a very, very rich man. But when I, and then uh, before, uh, then they had a big article that day about the Masonic Temple opening. And, um, but when I went in there, you know, just, when I looked up and I went, Oh my God, it's Augustus Schlotter. I know that means. I've been looking for you. I've been looking all over town for you, and I finally found you. I don't know. Oh, this is Mr. Colesworthy. He uh, was a bookbinder down on Exchange Street, but he was also an abolitionist, and he used to let the, uh, the uh, abolitionists use his, um, his, his store for their work. This is a picture of him. Um, but he uh, came in as a bookbinder. He also painted one of the, uh, the flags, the printer flag. He was the painter of it. I think him in Capen. Cape. No, Capen did all the others, but him and Hodgkins, they were painters. They, they kind of amateur, but they, you know, were pretty good. But Capen did all of them except for two, and I have those names in my, my book. Um, but he, he used to let the abolitionists use his printing equipment. That was neat. He was down uh, on, um, not Exchange, 4th Street. He had his, his office down there. His, uh, it's just interesting, his grandfather was part of the Boston Tea Party. I was, uh, that was and on his stone, what it reads is, for more than 40 years, he kept a bookstore at 92 Exchange Street, Portland, Maine. So it's kind of neat. When you find a stone that actually says something on it, you know, when you do this kind of research and stuff in the cemeteries, it's important. <laughs> it's a good thing. And this is um, his father's stone, Samuel. Now this is an interesting, this is E.T. Burroughs. Um, he was, came in as a manufacturer in 1898. He was the son of Irish immigrants born here in Portland. He patented screens in 1878 and became very successful with this. You know, I've read, you know, like, he, you know, people, if you think about it, to have screens put in your house, if you've never had screens, it, people were like elated because they could open their windows and their doors and the flies wouldn't come in and the dust and so, he also um, went on to make pool tables, cedar chests, crank phonograph cabinets, and tools. He was located right where the Holiday Inn is now, on Spring Street. That was where his, um, his business was. Let's see, I have pictures of that. Um, that this is an actual picture of the, uh, his company there, right where the Holiday Inn is. When they, remember when they took 
Fry Hall, and then they went down. Does anybody remember? I don't remember. Was Burroughs? How late was that building? Oh, well, I know that um, my brother-in-law had an aunt, and my husband had an aunt who worked there. So did that they probably... Did they boxes? They could have, yeah. They did. Easily yeah, could have. Well, I don't... Oh, I kind of yeah, remember that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I was surprised. I, I couldn't... I didn't remember it, but I... You know, um, my brother-in-law's aunt remembered it. She worked there. But his, if you look at this, it's like a Greek, a Roman, uh, the, and then the big urn in the center. It's, it's unique. It's, it's like the only one of its kind there in the cemetery. So you have many family buried with them? Oh, yeah. Um, well, all those yeah, there? the footstones. Oh, and it, oh, yeah. Yeah. Numerals instead of yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting stone. And the next is Thomas Beals, another um, furniture maker from Portland. Came in in 1887, and he, he also is a Civil War veteran. I believe he's on the Civil War tour also. He was a captain during the Civil War, and he fought at Cold Harbor in Petersburg. But he built beautiful, solid maple furniture. His last location, he'd been at Market Street in Newberry, but his last was out in Morrill's Corner. And I remember when they went out of business because I went there with a, a friend of mine because the furniture, I mean, it's comparable to Moosehead. You, you just can't buy furniture like that anymore. He, he, his stuff was wonderful. It's another, if you ever see it, buy it. And this is pictures of the chapel. And mind you, um, Frederick Thompson was the architect of this, and he's on my tour. I'll talk to him. But Art took these pictures of the chapel, which are, the chapel there is beautiful. It's built in 1907. It was a donation from the wilds um, in memory of her husband. It's non-denominational, and anyone buried at Evergreen can use this chapel. But the next one is a better look at Luther Pingreen. He was a patent maker. This guy, he was amazing too. He was a member in 1854, president in 1863 through 74. What most, what at post Civil War, he kind of patented artificial legs that with movable joints. That was his, yeah, you know, and and it was wonderful because and people from all over the country were sending to to have, you know to get one made because then they weren't just walking with the peg because there was so many after the Civil War, so many amputees. Um, he was also an inventor um, and his skills were used to making steam engines, carriages, mills for manufacturing lumber and models for patent office. He also served four commissions in the old state militia and fought in the Aroostook Wars, which I don't know much about. But And the next um, person is Frederick Thompson. He was quite the prolific architect. This is a picture of him that I, I took from here. <laughs> um, but he, this is the uh, walker, but he's also the uh, Western Prom, the West House up there on the Western Prom. Um, and I happen, whenever I see an article or anything, I cut it out. I'll, I'll leave my book here if anyone's interested in and looking at that. But just a few words on him. He was a member in 1889 and came in as an architect. He designed the Wild Chapel, as I mentioned. He designed wet, the West House on the Prom, the Walker Memorial Library in Westbrook, the former Children's Hospital on High Street, the Castle in the Park at Deering Oaks, which is now opening as a, as a restaurant, and the Portland Armory, which is now the Regency. Those are among some of, of the. And next is John Calvin Stevens, who I'm sure we all know. And I, ha when I do the tour, <laughs> I had a man one time, and he was just really wanted to see John Calvin Stevens and hear about him. And I'm like, yeah, we'll get to it, you know. <laughs> and he got there, and he's like, well, because <laughs> it's so, compared to when you're in there, to all the architect and all the stones, uh, as I'm sure you've noticed, Janet, um, it just seems so plain for somebody who, who was so prolific in Portland. And there's um, kind of like that picture of him. It's a little fady, but I like it. And there is the uh, house he lived at up on Bowdoin Street. And um, that's his, I think his great, great grandson standing in front of the house. He actually died on Craigie Street out in uh, Libertown. He, he uh, 
didn't uh, stay on Bowdoin Street. Um, so he he was a member in 1885. Um, he um, Oh, in October 8th is John Calvin Stevens Day. I don't know if anybody knows that or not. <laughs> in Portland, only in Portland, but I, I read that somewhere. I thought I'll throw it out there. He designed more than 300 buildings in Portland, such as Nathan Clifford School in the State Street Church on High Street. He taught here at the Maine Charitable Mechanics. He was a Brushian. Brushians were kind of a group of artists who used to kind of go around painting different uh, scenes. Mostly, I think they went out to Cape Elizabeth. Um, his, his claim to fame is that he really mastered the shingle style cottage that has become the symbol of coastal New England life. Um, and he, I mean, he's, he also, uh, well, he did Schlatterbacks, he did the post office too, the Portland post office down on Forest Avenue. Um, and then he helped redesign the ballroom here, I believe. So this is, this, <laughs> this says wish, but I'll, uh, when you look at it, it looks like that. The reason was this uh, man was not a member, but his son was. His son was Harold um, Wish, came in as an architect, but his father was a printer. So when they mm -hmm. lay out the printing, so when he had his dad, <laughs> did that, which I think is, you know, and then when I, when I, I looked up this man and he wasn't on the thing, but then I saw, and then I looked for, I go, oh, that was his son. So I said, well, I can put this in the door. I really <laughs> like that a lot. And then last but not least is Mr. Facet, Francis Facet, who was an architect, came in in 1878. Um, he became very um, busy after the fire of 1866 because, of course, everything had to be sort of rebuilt in Portland. And uh, he was, that's a good picture of him. He was a member in 1878. Um, John Calvin Stevens apprentice, apprenticed with him. Um, apprenticed with him. He designed Maine Medical Center, the Portland Public Library, the base of the Longfellow statue, Hay and Peabody's, which I believe is still on sale for one point something million dollars. Which Peabody? Hay and Peabody's uh, funeral home up on Congress Street. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and over 400 homes and buildings throughout the mm -hmm. state. So this is the library. And this is his house on Pine Street, which is also for sale. I think it's, um, I think they want close to a million for that. It's a duplex. Well, he lived on one side, his son was on the other. And uh, of course he designed Maine Medical Center where I work, so <laughs> I thought that was kind of neat. And uh, the base of the statue. So that kind of does it for this. I do have members that I didn't, like your T.J. Sparrow, the architect, he is buried at Evergreen, but he's, he was the first Portland architect. He's buried at Evergreen, but geographically not. He's like kind of way down like up below the hills, so. But his stuff is uh, in Brunswick, his, his works, which are beautiful. The one one I really want to mention is Mr. Um, Mr. Griffin, Edward Souther Griffin, he, um, let's see, this is a, a picture of his stone, but he was a, um, he started out as a wood carver painting and he did all the bows for Jacob Bows uh, on the ship for Jacob Winslow, who was the big shipping magnet here in Portland at the time. These were wooden ships. So he did the, all I can think of is like the Helen of Troy, where you see the beautiful, you know, whatever. And uh, so he did all of those, but unfortunately none are left because um, they were wood, number one. But they do have one of his, and it's at the uh, Fire Museum on Spring Street. It's an eagle or whatever. I guess they were quite nice. But in his son, his son also was a painter. But he is also responsible for, this is the Jacob Winslow statue at Evergreen Cemetery. Jacob Winslow was a shipping magnate, um, magnate here in Portland. Um, 
And uh, Mr. Griffin did, like I said, all those for his, um, for his boats. And it's kind of interesting when you're looking at Griffin's, when you look up, you can see over, you can see Jacob Winslow. But what happened was, of course, the, sh the wooden ships were taken over by, uh, w when iron, you know, was uh, produced. So that business kind of went out. So, he, so uh, uh, this Mr. Griffin started um, doing, um, Um, carving, granted. So he, the fireman that's up on Congress Street, he did this, that, and he also did the Jacob Winslow at, uh, at the cemetery. So he's a very productive man. Um, let's see if I missed anyone. I think I, oh, Mr. Capon. We do want to talk about him because of the, the flags. Um, I don't have a picture of Mr. Capon, but he, I mean, we know what he um, did with, he did 15 of the flags. He came in in um, 18, no, what was it? I don't have the actual date. Oh, 1826. He came in as a, as a printer, um, no, as a painter. Um, and then he, he, but he started out as a chair maker and then he started painting. And so he did do all of the, um, my book with the, the flag, oh, right in front of me, the flags. And what do you mean, the flags? The flags, the banners. You don't, you haven't seen, you know. You miss the airwalk. Yeah. Well, in, in um, 18, I think it was 1841, they had a tricentennial kind of expo here in Portland. And the old militias, the Revolutionary War, the old militias, you know, they always carried a banner for everything. So what they did here at MCMA is they made a banner for each of the professions that, that, that were here. So, and then they marched down Congress Street in the parade. Well, how many years ago was it that you found those flags? I can't remember what? now. The, fla the, the banners. Five years ago. But they, they, they were stored here. The the they were stored they were here. They in here. But there was, when I came here nine years ago, they were in a map case in that room in there. But previous right. to that, they hung them from the rafters. Yeah. So somebody came in and was shocked and said, no, that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so they put them away. So anyway, the Maine Historical Society uh, purchased them from... Well, from it was a consortium, Maine Historical Society, uh, Maine Historic... Uh, who else? Well, I read the Smithsonian did not bid on them. They were kind enough because they wanted them to stay here in Portland. They were going to come in if the if historical couldn't get it. Right. It was going to go to right. some other private yeah. collection. Maine State Museum was involved, I think. Yes. I don't know if, uh, if anybody wants mm -hmm. all that information. Well, yeah. on my tour, I also, when I come to Mr. Capon, I show the flags and, di and discuss in um, the banners, I guess I, I call them so flags. They they're the main historical oh, society. Are they on display or are they Two just are on display right now. No, just one night. Just one no, night. Just oh, okay. So they just have, but right. there's pictures. Right. Right. But next year they're going to show all of them, supposedly. Oh, they are. That would yeah. be nice. Right. I like that. I just have one more person that I'd, I'd really like to talk about because he happens to be He's also on my suffragist tour, <laughs> which, you know, this was an all-male um, play association, mm -hmm. and but I did want to make note that they used to let the suffragists use this building for meetings. Um, Newell Foster was his trade was a printer. He was the proprietor of the Daily Press, which I touched upon about the newspapers. His was the most liberal. He um, was born in New Hampshire. His father was a revolutionary soldier. His brother was Stephen S. Foster, who was a, a big abolitionist. He used to come around, not the musical no. Stephen Foster, uh -huh. the abolitionist, um, who used to go, made his living, actually, touring the states, giving anti-slavery um, lectures. Um, Mr. Foster was in the state legislature in um, 1860 through 67, and he procured $11,000 to help pay off the 40,000 uh, 
um, owed on this building. Um, he, why he's on my suffragist tour was obviously women were never going to get the right to vote unless men participated because they could vote. And, you know, we could get as many referendums going <laughs> as we wanted, but unless we had people there to, to vote it in. So, um, in the early, now, Mr. Foster died, I believe, in 1868. Um, so, the, um, he, he died in Massachusetts while attending a suffragist meeting with his wife and daughter. And he was actually voted vice president in Boston of one of the, the suffrage uh, um, associations, one of the, like in a particular church where they met or whatever, he was voted as vice president because when the suffragists were first starting out, you know, a lot of men would act as president, vice president for them. So, and uh, so I sort of really you know, give it to him for being, being such a liberal and being so, you know, involved in the suffrage movement. He died of a heart attack after attending that in Boston. He died at his brother uh, Stephen Foster's house. Um, and just another thing about um, women in the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association, during their expos and everything, they did give, give prizes to women, which I thought was honorable. Um, so. You know, it's an all, it was an all-male thing, but I don't believe it was sexist, and I, I like that. So, anyway, that's how I'll end. <laughs>